Welcome back once again to the Imaginary Gallery. It's TJ, your host, and we are at the end of our list from the John Powell book. Why am I afraid to tell you who I am? I haven't covered every single game or role in the book. I picked a few from my personal choice. So feel free to go to your used bookstore and look at one. But the next one on the list, The Dreamer. This game clearly an escape game. Dreamers are intent upon flight from reality. They achieve wonderful things in a fantasy world where they receive recognition and honor. Many times their dreams are a substitute for achievement and represent some kind of compensation for their lack of success with and in the real world. These people who are dreamers usually like movies. They love stories because such flights of fancy stoke their imaginations with brand new settings and materials for future reveries. Now eventually they create a comfortable world in which they can become somebody. Very often Ten dreamers have ambitioned more than their abilities can actually reach, and they have to compensate themselves in a fantasy for their disappointment in reality. This would be sometimes called neurotic fiction. These dreamers have an alibi to explain every actual failure in their lives. They just can't bring their ambitions into line with their abilities. What they really need most is the courage to accept themselves as they are. Next on the list is The Drinker, The Problem, and Dope Addict. The dreamer escapes from reality on the magic carpet of fantasy. The drinker tries the route of narcotics. Narcosis. Those who are most vulnerable to stress are usually most in need of an escape. Addiction to drink or narcotic drugs is usually found in those who react very poorly to deprivation, who are most easily overcome by defeat, those who are most self-conscious and ill at ease with others. This is not to deny, of course, that addiction is or can be genetic. The momentary release and the experience of freedom enjoyed under the sedation of excessive drink or drugs is usually followed by heightened anxiety and a deeper depression when this haze clears. This, of course, brings on further needs for sedation to deaden the anxiety, the sense of guilt, and the sense of depression. Drinking and drugs as a way out are definitely limited in their capacity to do the job. Leaving reality while the narcosis lasts only makes it more difficult to return to reality and have to live with it. The name of the game is a crutch. For sociability, self-expression, the concealment of embarrassment, and the passability of forgetting one's troubles. Next on this list would be the intellect, alias the egghead. Our social programming many times makes it much easier for us to be intellectual and to scorn fuller human reactions, especially in so far as they are emotional. Many times the role of the intellect is assumed by those who are afraid of their emotions or are uncomfortable with them for any kind of reason. Perhaps they were programmed not to show them, 
or to think that sentiment is weakness. Sometimes, too, people find themselves unable to relate easily with others or to enjoy friendship, and so they resort to their pose of intellectualism. The Avara Tower of such intellectualism is also a common refuge from the competition involved in human relations. In themselves, the learning processes are not as threatening to most of us as are other people. The classroom is preferable to the cold, cruel world that we have been taught we should fear. More timid souls would rather read about life then try to live it. Library stacks can be a retreat from the headaches of daily life, and they can provide the solace of isolation and the prestige of being a scholar. They can also be an escape from social responsibilities. Now, those who are programmed for isolation are usually more inclined to scholarly work than to meaningful relations with others. Rather than admit that they're a hermit, <laughs> shut off from society, the players of this particular game insist that they are dedicated to higher learning. Incidentally, this game frees us from committees, organizations, having to pay our dues, social responsibilities, and making friends. And then the author in parentheses says, Please note, this is definitely not intended as an indictment of scholars. The true scholar makes a valuable contribution to the society, but no one is called to be a scholar at the expense of being a truly human being, comma, a fully functioning persona. Next on the list is the mommy. The overprotective mother, or more rarely a father, plays a harmful game. Mommies, or daddies, usually produce little monsters. Utterly selfish people who demand their own way in every single thing. Such children are tragically unprepared for a world that's simply unwilling to baby them and accede to their every whim. Psychological studies done on soldiers in wartime show that those who crack up most often and most severely are the products of overprotective mommies or daddies. The most often Ten requested song of soldiers when Bing Crosby visited the South Pacific troops in World War II was Brahms' lullaby. This game is not motivated by genuine, healthy, and mature love. There are three possible causes. Number one, neurotic anxiety. The insecure mama is fearful that her children may suffer some kind of harm unless she does everything for them. Number two, hostility. Strange as it may seem, maternal overprotection is sometimes an overcompensation, reaction, formation, for a sub or unconscious hostility towards her children. She atones for her personal dislike of her children by conscientious devotion to them. And number three, frustrated marital relations. The mama who's unhappy with her husband frequently pours all of her pent-up feelings of affection onto her children. Under such circumstances, the children bear the brunt of the unsatisfied love life of the mother. The next game on this list would be the pouter. The pouting game is played by emotional children. Pouters just can't sit down and openly discuss interpersonal problems, usually because their position or problem is irrational and they secretly know it. They can scourge others emotionally by their silent treatment, sad looks, and so on. Without having to tell people what's really bothering them, well, they can sulk, 
without accepting the responsibility of having to explain why they are acting this way. Because a full explanation might sound so ridiculously retarded that they know that the other person might even laugh at them. <laughs> However, they can derive their needed satisfaction and indulge their own self pity without having to work out difficult situations through communication. Next on the list is resentfully yours. When born loser types look for a scapegoat for their own failures, many times they will blame somebody or something else. Life, the establishment, the breaks. They resent the success and happiness of other people because their own lives in comparison, are unhappy. They've been somehow deprived. We're all tempted to make our own failures understandable by explaining them in terms of something other than our own inadequacies, being treated unfairly by others, or injustice, the conspiracy of circumstances, and so on, make it easier for us to face our failures. The resentful person uses up all of their energies resenting, and therefore they accomplish usually very little. <laughs> Sometimes it seems the most vicious critics of anything, many times the ones that do nothing for the institutions they criticize so vocally. Resentful people are forever trying to bring their case before the court of life, hoping that the jury of others will acquit them of their failures. Resentment comes from the Latin resentire, which is to feel all over again. Resenters are always rehearsing and rehashing the past. They insist on reliving past battles that they cannot win, and they many times persist in this game for an entire lifetime. Hmm, sounds great. No one's feelings are caused by others. Our feelings are caused by our own emotional response, our own choices, and reactions. Resenters are reactors, not actors, and eventually, once they realize this, they are left with no vestiges of self-respect. They've spent their entire lives employing a failure mechanism and they somehow know it. He ends this by stating that resentment is a cop-out. The next and final part, the worrier. Rollo May, in his book, The Meaning of Anxiety, states that normal anxiety is proportioned to the objective threat or danger to the existence of a person or individual. Neurotic anxiety, however, is disproportionate to the objective danger. The most common cause of disproportionate anxiety is the insecurity an individual has experienced as an infant and child. If infants are not giving the needed sensations of security, meaning that they're not held in secure arms, they're not rocked, tenderly to sleep, and so on. And if children are not sure of their parents' love, their level of anxiety will probably be very high. The game always follows the program. As a game, worry is an immature way to handle difficulties. Worriers usually get on a treadmill. They go over the same ground over and over, getting nowhere. In the end, however, they'll have ulcers. They repeat useless statements of their problem. They rehearse alternatives without reaching any kind of decision. They calculate all the possible consequences of possible decisions again and again and again. Worriers will probably feel guilty for not doing anything constructive. So they do something. They worry. You got a term paper coming up. Psychologically, worry is related to anxiety, which results from supercharged, repressed emotions, such as hostility, with or without an external threat. It's therefore possible for chronic worriers to feel ill at ease without knowing what's actually bothering them. The internal pressures of repressed emotions 
don't always need external stimuli to produce this uncomfortable feeling. It is one of the high prices we have to pay for emotional repression. I am the narco and I'm a transgendered lesbian. I know from what I heard, you were really heartbroken when I vanished without a trace, not even a phone call or a text. Well, honey, I couldn't because I knew that your parents would put two and two together, especially your father who was on the police force. He would take one look at my mugshot and he would instantly know that I was the one that his son was entering in my virgin Virginia. And I couldn't deal with that, so I had to leave. I had to leave town. I changed my name. That's just the way it works. And I know it was especially heartbreaking for you, because from what I understand, I'm the first one that your sisters actually approved of, because normally your sisters can't stand any of the skanks you bring home. I'm better than those skanks. When I came to your house for dinner that time, when I said I had to go to the restroom and pretended to have gotten lost, I went into each of your sister's bedrooms and I looked through their things and I saw slim fat. I saw diet pills. I saw all this weight loss stuff. I made sure when I was around them to mention how thin they looked and how trim they were and how I'd love to have their body, even though mine was a hundred times better. They didn't need to know that I knew that. And they all just melted in my hands. Oh, they loved it. They didn't know I looked in their room. So I just told them how thin they were and I wished my body looked like theirs. And that won them over. It's not that difficult, being the narcopath. I know when we first started hanging out together. I thought I had you convinced, but I didn't know any guys in the city because I'd been away for so long even though I'd lived here for several months. And you bought it. And I remember one particular night when we were out. At one of your nightclubs that I've never been to. Well, maybe I had a few years ago, but not lately. And we happened to run into one of my old friends. Surprise, surprise, which was such a coincidence because I hadn't gone out there in so long. But I remember how you went up to that friend and supposedly asked him if you were making a mistake by being around me. And he had told you some kind of nasty stuff. I'll never know what he actually said. But he basically tried to steer you away from me. And when you had told me this, I just said, Ah, oh, he has a crush on me. He was jealous because I was with you. He didn't want me to be happy with you. He's a troublemaker. And you bought it, of course. Well, honey, that's a lie. Since I'm giving confessions. He was one that I used to date. While I was dating his roommate. And of course, his roommate didn't know. Yes. So now do you understand why I couldn't tell you? I couldn't explain why he said that? I know you asked, why would he say such a thing? Well, huh, I thought my answer was pretty good. He had a crush on me, and he wasn't going to have me. And you should be proud that you do have me. And we made love afterwards, so as far as I'm concerned, it worked. Ah. Uh. And now on to the more serious stuff. Probably the only stuff that you're interested in. I understand that you finally, took you long enough, found that thousand dollar bond missing from your dresser. Oh my god, you deserve to have that lost. I took that so long ago and it's long been spent. And I know that you're wanting to press charges against me for it. Well honey, you're never going to see that money. I've changed my name, I've changed my gender, so they're not going to find me. So, suck it up. Sorry to be so rude, but you deserve it. How dare you have more money than I did, and yours didn't run out like mine. Your luck didn't run out like mine did. I thought you deserved every bit of the heartbreak I gave to you. Oh my god! Ah!